between. Uh, you can, you can, you can, you can. What do you want to do? Pop it again. Pop it again. Oh, 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 oh. The delivery suite of a maternity hospital. The midwife is preparing to bring a new life into the world. Disinfecting her hands, wearing an apron and using surgical gloves all add to the control of infection that could affect the baby. Our mother is ready to give birth and her baby is about to emerge from the protective environment of the womb. During the nine months of its development in the womb, the baby has lived in a secure environment. The mother's blood has given her baby a certain amount of natural immunity and it has inherited the ability to develop an immune system of its own. The start of a new life. The baby's new immune system is not fully operational. It must first be educated or programmed to cope with the challenges of life in the outside world. Baby Alexander continues to acquire immunity from his mother through her breast milk. This helps protect him until he develops his own immune system. This type of immune protection is known as passive immunity. It's provided to the baby, in this case by the mother, rather than the baby's own body working to create its immunity. Babies can benefit from this for about the first year of life, but sooner or later it needs to get its own system fully activated. So why do we need an immune system and how does it work? Well, that's what we'll be exploring in this episode of The Virtual Body. Germs, such as bacteria, viruses and other microorganisms capable of attacking our bodies and causing diseases, lurk all around us. It's our immune system that keeps these germs in check and it has many lines of defence. Some general and basic, others highly specific. An amazing evolutionary adaptation to living amongst harmful microbes and substances. So let's start with the first line of defence. Skin forms a tough barrier against bacteria and viruses. Then there's mucus. Our orifices are lined with sticky mucus membranes which trap microorganisms and stop them attacking cells underneath. Our airways are lined with hairs and lower down our air passages, tiny hair like cilia waft bacteria and dust away from the lungs. And then we have chemical lines of defence. Sweat, saliva and tears. Stomach acid brings a grisly end to many microorganisms which manage to invade through our mouths or in our food. What's more, we also have our own resident population of harmless bacteria that live on and in our skin. Here they can prevent the infectious bacteria from gaining a foothold and launching a full-scale attack on us. During her fall, Georgia has grazed her hands and the skin surface has been broken. An open wound has been created. Disease-causing organisms known as pathogens can now easily enter her body. Let's examine what's happening to her grazed hands. Blood vessels have been ruptured and blood escapes through the open wound. Blood is precious and so the body acts quickly to stop excessive loss. What process has stopped the blood from flowing out of the wound? Well, quite simply, blood clotting. The blood is changed from a liquid to a solid state by a rapid series of chemical changes, and a clot is formed. The clot is a mesh of fibres that traps blood cells to form a solid jelly-like plug. This blocks the opening so that no more blood can escape, but also, and very importantly, it stops any germs from getting in. While the clotting's taking place, a whole variety of other reactions are also happening simultaneously. We've all cut ourselves at some time, so can you describe the series of events and reactions that will happen at the damaged site? You can see the changes happening. Around the damaged area, the skin is reddening, it's getting hotter, 
it's swelling a little and it's certainly painful. Now all these things together are called inflammation. So why is inflammation a useful reaction to body damage? Well remember, the body is trying to stop infection from getting in, to prevent it from spreading if it does break through, and then to make long-term repairs. The inflammation helps it to do all these things. So what causes inflammation to occur? To find out, we need to go inside the bone marrow, where our blood system includes two types of white blood cells. Phagocytes and lymphocytes. These white cells are involved from the start, but they attack pathogens or germs in different ways. Both types of white blood cells are produced here in the bone marrow. Unlike red blood cells, they don't have haemoglobin, but they do possess a nucleus. When the young girl grazed her hands, a chemical was released that alerted the white blood cells to take action against the invaders. These cells are constantly patrolling the body in the bloodstream. When they receive an alert signal, they in turn release another chemical called histamine. It's the histamine which causes the blood flow to increase at the damaged area, and with it comes an increase in heat and fluids. Other alarms have also been triggered by all this activity, and more white blood cells are called into action, the phagocytes. These attack the invading bacteria directly. The phagocytes are remarkable cells. They change shape and are very mobile and can move through the walls of blood capillaries into the tissues. When a phagocyte finds a germ, it engulfs it, kills it and digests it, a process known as phagocytosis. Phagocytes are an army. They lie in wait for germs to invade the tissue. The battle continues. More white blood cells rush to the scene and the casualties mount up. This is pus, that yellow substance we sometimes find in spots and cuts. It's made up largely of dead phagocytes, destroyed bacteria and other cell debris. In most cases, this attack strategy is successful. The invaders are destroyed and the healing process can continue. But what happens if the pathogens are not destroyed? Well then, we need to turn to some more sophisticated weaponry, the lymphocytes. In fact, the T and B lymphocytes. These specialised white blood cells are the Exocet missiles of our defence system. Their mission is to seek out and destroy. This young girl is suffering from a disease called chickenpox. It's a highly contagious infection and is caused by a virus that entered through her respiratory tract. She unfortunately caught the disease from another child at her nursery. All she can do is rest at home whilst her body tries to fight the disease. The virus has been incubated inside her body for 14 days. The classic symptoms of chickenpox are the inflamed red spots seen all over her body. Should we put a bit more cream on? The high temperature fever she is suffering is another immune reaction. There we go. Her body is attempting to destroy the virus by raising her temperature. I think that will do now. Do you want to lean back now? But raising the temperature is not enough on its own. She needs another line of attack. The outer signs of viral infection are only a small part of what's happening inside the body. The specific immune response has begun. If we go beneath the outer surface of the skin, we'll get a much closer look at the chickenpox virus. Once inside the bloodstream, we see the virus, not a scale, of course. It has an outer coat with its own special proteins on its surface, called antigens. Antigens are any substance that stimulate an immune response. They can be proteins or carbohydrates. The chickenpox viral antigens activate B lymphocytes, which then release their own unique proteins called antibodies. The antibodies chemically lock onto the antigens, destroying the germs in the process. Reinforcements arrive as more and more of these B cells are produced, all programmed to release chickenpox antibodies. Within a week or so, the battle is won and the infection is over. Most of these particular B cells will disappear, but amazingly, once our bodies have been exposed to a particular antigen, like the chickenpox virus, our immune system remembers it by storing a library of B cells that have been used before. So the next time our young girl meets a chickenpox virus, her body is ready with a swift and vigorous response. 
This response is so strong, in fact, that the infection may not even begin. She is immune to chickenpox. The B lymphocytes began life in the bone marrow, like the other type of white blood cells, the phagocytes. Collectively, they're capable of producing a wide range of different antibodies, each specific to a particular antigen. The antibody can recognise its antigen by its shape, and they fit together a bit like a lock and key. That immobilises the invader, and the infection is overcome. Certain invaders, or germs, like tetanus, do their damage by releasing poisonous substances called toxins. All right, lovely. First of all, it has to have its two injections, OK, and some polo drops, which are by mouth. Tetanus is a serious bacterial disease that kills about 100 people every year in Britain. Tetanus, or lockjaw, is a disease caused by particular bacteria. And what happens is that the bacterium liberates a, a poison or a toxin which causes damage to other tissue. Now you can prevent tetanus by taking that toxin and modifying it slightly chemically to produce what's known as a toxoid. That toxoid is then injected as the tetanus toxoid vaccine where it is recognised by cells in the specific immune system and in particular B cells to produce antibodies. Those antibodies, if they ever come across the toxin again, simply stick to it like a glove in a hand and block its action. Vaccinations and antitoxins are a very valuable resource, but the body doesn't have to rely solely on artificial immunity to combat the dangerous pathogens. The immune system has plenty more tricks up its sleeve, the T cells. Watch as this smaller T lymphocyte attacks the much larger pathogen. Let's go back and look at how a new baby is settling down with her mother. Newborn babies have an organ called a thymus, which lies in the chest between the breastbone and the heart. It's within the thymus that primitive T cells develop. The thymus is most active in the early stages of life and is much less important in adults. What's that? Is that nice? It's the killer T cells that mount a direct attack on the infected cells and bacteria. Killer T cells attack infected body cells and germs directly by punching holes in the cell membranes of the attackers. Cytoplasm leaks out of the cells and they die. This is a brilliant means of defence, but it's not very helpful all the time. The immune system works tirelessly to keep our body systems free from invading germs. But as we know, occasionally things don't go according to plan. Right, Hannah, you've come back for your asthma checkup today. I just want you to have a blow into my peak flow meter. You've used it before. Sometimes our immune systems can become hypersensitive or confused and start to damage the very body it was designed to protect. This is known as an allergic or hypersensitivity reaction. Well done, that's brilliant. There are different types of hypersensitivity reactions. Perhaps the simplest and a good example would be what is known as a type 1 reaction or anaphylaxis. That's the uh, disorder when, for instance, certain people who eat peanuts can have a massive reaction and become very ill and, and even die. Um, we know that you're allergic to nuts and do you remember I said to you that we were going to get you a pen? And that you've got to carry peanut that. allergy is an increasingly common disorder. The peanut antigen triggers the release of certain chemicals that cause blood vessels to dilate and fluid to accumulate in the lungs. Anti-allergenic treatments really work at two levels. At a prevention level, you can use drugs that stop the cells releasing chemicals, uh, drugs like uh, adrenaline, which come as an EpiPen, which you can just stick in into your okay, muscle. That's it, and you've got to pretend to bash it into your leg like that. OK, that's it, well done. And that causes the blood vessels to contract and helps maintain blood flow around the body. The second line of drugs actually can be used to treat uh, an established allergic reaction. So when I get asthma, um, what happens is that my respiratory tract constricts, fluid accumulates there, and I have difficulty breathing. So I can use an inhaler which widens up the uh, breathing passages and makes it easier for me to breathe. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And hold it. That's it. The human immune system has a complex and difficult task keeping us alive and well. But when the immune system fails, 
the consequences can be devastating. <coughs> Tuberculosis, or TB, is a disease caused by an infection of the bacteria Mycobacterium tuberculosis. In Britain, the incidence of TB fell dramatically during the 20th century, mainly because of improvements in our living standards, but also because of the discovery of effective antibiotics and vaccines. TB can affect many organs in the body, but in the majority of cases, the lungs are the most severely affected. Sufferers have a persistent cough because of the destruction of their lung tissue. Tuberculosis can be successfully treated with antibiotics, though recently the number of people affected has increased due partly to the spread of HIV. However, the vaccine BCG has proved to be effective in protecting babies in the first year of their lives against the disease. The science behind vaccinations is based on the effect of secondary immune responses. But many diseases are not responsive to vaccinations. The common cold and influenza are two such examples. Diseases like these either mutate very quickly or have so many different strains that we can't vaccinate against them all. Human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, is an especially problematic pathogen because it infects some of the very cells designed to protect us the T cells. As Ian Parker knows only too well, when 15 years ago he discovered he was suffering from HIV. Today he has AIDS. I actually caught it through gay sex, but I was married. Uh, it was just that at the time we were being quite liberal about what we did. And uh, it was actually the first partner I'd ever had with a man. Some progress has been made in developing drugs to lessen the symptoms of AIDS, but these drugs are still not a cure. Uh, this is the tin that I keep my uh, pills in that I've got to take for HIV. There's two of them, two of those three times a week. Two of them twice a day. And these are the protease inhibitors. Two of them twice a day, dissolved in water. The drugs keep the disease under control and allow the sufferers to lead a relatively normal life for longer. The jelly bean ones, which is Ampinavir, and it is eight twice a day. So that amounts to a day's supply of pills. Our immune system is complex and finely tuned. It works from the earliest stages in the womb, develops after birth, and continues through life to protect us against all manner of infections. It's successful because of its ability to detect many different kinds of attack, chemical, bacterial, and viral. But it also needs to protect us against things that can go wrong within our own bodies. Dead or damaged cells must be removed, and rogue cells, like cancer cells, must be quickly destroyed. So our immune system needs to recognise the difference between invaders and ourselves and also the difference between our cells which are healthy and those which are not. It is truly remarkable. <laughs>